Good evening. My name is Aaron Channel, and this is California Convictions. This is my YouTube channel where I talk about whatever I feel like, honestly, but by and large, it's uh, prison, prison-related stuff. I, I spent a bunch of time in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, and I speak about it whenever I have the interest and whenever anybody wants to listen to me here on YouTube. Today, I intend to speak about standard housing environments, shall we stay girl, in prison and jail. There's a couple of different ways that you can end up housed whenever you're in prison and it really makes a difference. <clears throat> the primary consideration isn't how you feel about it. They're not going to ask you, well, would you rather be in a cell or a dorm? They go by your security risk the degree of danger that you pose to other inmates and to staff and possibly even to yourself and the degree of danger that other inmates pose to you. The most secure condition that you're likely to be housed in is in a cell, meaning that you are in a locked room with a locked door, concrete, and you aren't allowed out of that room except for strict and supervised activities. It's the most secure they can keep an inmate, and possibly you're allowed a celly, meaning that you share the room with one other person. The only reason that you wouldn't be allowed to do this is if you were considered so much of a risk to murder or rape or hurt somebody, or so much of a risk to have that happen to you, that you couldn't safely cohabitate even in a little cell with one other person. A lot of guys spend the entirety of their prison terms in a cell. Again, locked room, one other person. The interesting thing about this type of environment is how closely related and involved you get with the guy that you're living with. I've said before, in the summer, you and your cell, you're going to cook together. You're going to sweat the walls are going to be a hundred degrees and you're both going to let out a sigh of relief whenever the sun sets and you're a little cooler and in the winter you're going to freeze together he's going to be coming in and you're going to know that his fingertips might be a little blue because he was out rather on, out on the yard and you're going to have a blanket ready for him tell him come on man you're going to be all right because you get put down on that yard and you can lie down on the snow for an hour it's real rough he gets bad news and he's going to tell you about it and it's going to break your heart. His mom's going to die and you're going to lose sleep over it because you're around that guy all day, all the time. Gina Lester knows, notes that she would want to sell all on her own just in case the other person is crazy. And it's absolutely the case. If you are by yourself, you are 100% in control of that environment. You don't have to worry about somebody waking you up in the middle of the night with a knife in their hand and a creepy smile on their face. On the other hand, you're all alone. And it's difficult to describe to somebody who hasn't experienced it how after the initial difficulty, after the couple of hours, the day, or even the week or two that it takes you to get used to alone, once you get past that, the time stretches in a real strange, kind of surreal and uncomfortable way. I understand how people can lose their minds just being by themselves day after day after week after month. It, it impacts you in a strange way. <clears throat> In the event <clears throat> that the administration determines that you are not the biggest security risk, you don't need to be in a cell all the time, well, they're going to kick you out to the yard, general population. You may very well still be in a cell, but it's a little different because now there are group activities, day room, yard, a job, the library. If you're not back in the hole, you see your celly a heck of a lot less unless you're on lockdown. That door opens for breakfast at like 6.30 or 7 sometimes. You go to work, and then you go to yard, you go to dinner. You might see your celly for just a couple hours. It's considered good practice for cellies to find ways to schedule their time so they're not always together. If I work in the kitchen in the morning and my celly is going to get a job, I tell a man, don't get a morning job, especially don't get a morning job in the kitchen. 
get an evening job. That way, whenever I come home from work, you'll just be getting ready to go, and we won't have to smell each other's farts and clean up after each other's dropped stuff and the thousand things that you just get so tired of putting up with from a celly. I won't have to put up with it. <laughs> Erox530 says, uh, nice beard, and that he enjoys listening to me. I, I was on a hiatus. I didn't do any lives for a couple of months, but I'm trying to be a little more consistent, and I'm looking forward to talking some more about my experiences while I was incarcerated. Speaking about this type of thing really is perhaps the, the best therapy, and anybody who takes the time to listen to what I have to say, sincerely, thank you. In the event that the administration determines that you are not such a security risk, you need to be in a cell at all, you're going to get put in a dormitory environment, meaning it's not just going to be you and your roommate, your celly, in one room. It's going to be you and your eight roommates or your 12 roommates or your 35 roommates, hopefully in a room big enough to accommodate however many people they decide to have go into their dorm. Dorms can be small. In Chowchilla, they had eight-man dorms that had previously been four-person dorms whenever the women were there. And they weren't huge. I mean, you could walk from one side to the other in just a couple of steps. For inmate purposes, for the amount of personal space that I had, it was pretty impressive. But still, it's not what you would think of as a room to house four people. Frankly, your bedroom, in the event that you don't live in a very small apartment, is probably as large as the dorms they had set aside for four to eight people in Chowchilla. Still, because the door opens all the time, because they make sure that you have access to certain communal facilities, restrooms, showers, phones, that type of thing, dorms can be pretty awesome. Especially if you have a good routine. You have some people that you get along with that maybe you play cards with, or all who cook or work out, or heck, do drugs, whatever it is that you enjoy, if you have a group of people that you do it with in a dormitory, a lot of guys treat prison like it's a little party, and uh, frankly, I can understand the appeal of this particular aspect of life. It's kind of fun to have your four or five friends that all live in the same area as you do, and you just run around doing whatever fun thing, fun in quotations there, that you happen to enjoy. Of course, the reason CDC likes to put inmates in dormitory environments where you have eight guys in a room or 15 guys in a room or whatever it is, is because it's more efficient for space. There's only so many square feet they have inside of the electric fence. It's more efficient for staff. It's easier for one officer to watch 20 guys in a room than it is to watch 20 guys in 20 separate rooms. As a result, CDC pushes dormitory living to the point that whenever it became overcrowded, they began building dormitories anywhere they could. They started with the inmate gymnasiums. Gymnasium is just what it sounds like. It's like a high school gym. It's a big empty room that most prisons have a couple of set aside for inmates to do things like exercise or play basketball. Or, heck, if there's a riot and they just need some place to have 100 inmates stay for a couple of hours... It's convenient to have a big open-air gymnasium like that. Of course, they decided to start putting bunks in these gymnasiums. They called them the gyms. And every yard had a big open room that they put about 100, maybe as many as 130 inmates in, depending on how much space they had and how many bunks they decided to put two or three in a row. This was an uh, uncomfortable living environment. I lived in a day, uh, day room bunks for a couple of years, and I lived in a gymnasium for about a, about a year. And the Supreme Court actually ruled on a number of things that CDC was doing, saying that it was a literally cruel and unusual punishment. Now, generally, I, I am not a play the world's tiniest violin for all the poor felons that have life hard in prison type of guy. Dude, prison sucks. It should. It shouldn't be needlessly cruel, but if it was a great place to go, more people would want to go there. It should be a bad place. That said, some of the things that they did in the day room bunks and the gymnasiums in order to make it more efficient to house the inmates, I think may have done lasting damage to some guys. One would be the lights. 
because they have so many inmates milling about in kind of an open air area, a hundred inmates that just you're trusting that they're going to stay in bed all night. <clears throat> One of the ways that the staff makes sure that everybody's behaving is by taking very bright lights and leaving them on all day and all night. That way you're well lit. They can see you. Unfortunately, there have been numerous studies done, and it was my personal experience that whenever you're always under these bright lights, whenever you don't have darkness to sleep, whenever you don't have a regulated circadian rhythm in order to allow the suprachiasmatic nexus, the part in your brain that regulates your cycle, to regulate whenever you're going to put out melatonin, you get a little erratic. Your dreams become very vivid and infrequent. You, you can suffer small emotional swings. I don't mean people go insane. But after a couple of weeks, a couple of months, heck, a year or two for some guys of living in this brightly lit, always loud environment, now you do see some strain. Start The California Department of Corrections get rid of their day room bunks, get rid of their gyms. They determined that the conditions that they had to endure in these communal living environments, most notably the lack of access to prompt and decent medical care, did qualify as cruel and unusual punishment. It violated the Constitution. I was asked by Gina Lester if you can ever work it out to have your friend sell with you, and the answer is absolutely. In fact, it's encouraged, and it's not immediate. It's not like you roll up on the yard and your friend Frank goes, Oh, Jim, come here! And you're living with Frank that night. Uh, maybe you get lucky, maybe Frank's the clerk that works in the office like I did, or you know, Frank's a porter, or the cop really wants to do Frank a favor, or maybe Frank just stabbed his last celly, I don't know. It's possible you get moved in there quick. The general rule of thumb, though, is hurry up and wait. You and Frank talk about it, you decide that you and he want to live together. Cool. The thing is that you already have a celly, and Frank already has a celly. So Frank tells his celly, hey man, I, I need you to move so I can move in my friend. Oh, sure thing, Frank. But where am I going to go? Oh, you can move in with his celly. Except then your celly and his celly meet each other and they go, no, 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 I'm not living with that, dude. I, I'm in this gang, he's in that one. Or I'm real clean and he's a slob. Or I heard that dude farts all the time. Wh whatever the issue is, it's pretty good odds. They don't want to live with each other. And so now you're doing a scavenger hunt. Well, if we send this guy here and that guy here and the two of them live together, then you can move to there and Frank can live with me, right? And it all works, but you've got six people that all need to agree that they're going to want to move to do the musical chairs to make it work out. And you can't just move. The cops need to keep track of where you are. So you fill it all out on paper and you go to the clerk or possibly the officer and say, hey, officer, we need to get these six moves done. And he looks, he goes, six moves? Why? Well, me and my friend want to live together. Yeah, but that's six moves. That's a lot of writing I got to do. That's a lot of watching you guys move. Just, just put up with it for a little while. And it drags out. And once you do have a good celly, once you're there with your friend, or I actually knew two separate sets of brothers and a set of cousins who ended up selled up together. Because they hit the yard, and they happened to have a familial relationship, and they just worked at it until finally the cops arranged to have them sold up together. It can be a lot of fun being sold up with somebody that you get along well with, but especially with family, friends, people you're actually emotionally close to, there can be a strain, too. Uh, if you guys get bad news in a letter, it's both of you that got the bad news, perhaps. Or even if not, maybe you and your friend have a little bit of uh, water under the bridge. And after being together all day, all night, all day, all night, all, all the time, finally you jump off of your bed and say, you know what, I remember six years ago whenever you did that thing I'm still pissed off about. Because you're just sick of it. Eric's 530 says that in county jail it was a big hangout. Nobody acted like they worry about their charges. There's nothing like a county reunion. And there's some real truth to that. Part of it is uh, playing tough. You know, you find out you're looking at maybe 10 whole years. Your lawyer said you might just do two, but the DA says 10 and you're a little scared. Or heck, maybe you're not. Maybe you're a psychopath and you're looking forward to prison. But whatever it is, 
You walk into the block and you go, I ain't afraid of two years. I can do that standing on my head. And the DA says 10. My lawyer says he's full of it. What good is it going to do you to go in there crying to the fellas? Gosh, guys, I don't know what I'm going to do. So you play it tough. And so does everybody else. In an environment where everybody's playing it tough, you get a, a false bravado. It turns into a big party. Everybody just have fun all the time. And if we get punished, who cares? Some guys don't care, but the guys that do care have no choice but to kind of go along with the program. It is no fun being the one inmate going, Oh, fellas, maybe it's time to turn out the lights and go to bed. It's, get, it's getting late and we have to work tomorrow, right? This is a bunch of convicts, criminals, people that do not necessarily always make good life choices. And even if they do, well, they want to have some fun. It's not your job to stop them. <clears throat> Conservative Juggalo notes that San Quentin has five dorm with a hundred bunk beds, but whenever he was there, it was one to a bunk. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the uh, the bigger dorms there in San Quentin are pretty big. I think that's on East Yard, which I never went to. I was there in uh, West Yard with uh, Badger, Alpine, Carson, and Donner, the big five-tier setups. CDC isn't as crowded nowadays as it was when I was doing time. I've been out for five, and I ain't been active for, God, 15 or something like that. It's nice that it's not as crowded. I don't think it means people are committing fewer crimes, but uh, maybe they're not getting caught, or maybe they're not getting broken off. But at least for the guys in prison, it's got to be nice to be able to walk from one end of the hallway to the other without saying three people, hey, excuse me, brother, i got to get past you. Vegas prison stories. What's up? Um, <clears throat> Mark asks if I was actually involved of the murder of the pedophile who came to my rural county. Um, listen, I cannot deny that I was involved in some way in the whole thing, and my co-defendant, Ty Brew, is supposed to get out. When he does, dude, I'll answer any stinking question, but until that day, all I can really say is, listen, the, the guy was absolutely a piece of garbage and whatever ty bruce has happened that's what happened because he's got to go before a parole board and the only thing i have to say about it is he's telling the truth and anybody else is lying whatever story he tells whatever he says i did i did it <clears throat> um erox 530 oh that's okay uh Badger section, absolutely. Uh, conservative Juggalo notes that Badger section and their uh, West Block is, uh, he's been there. I tell you what, and I, I'm curious, so holler out, did it stink whenever you were there? Because, man, I could not believe all of West Block, but especially Badger section. It had an old sewage smell that just never went away. It didn't matter if you scrubbed your cell, if you scrubbed the tear, if you went out in every inch of everything. Yeah, the place still stunk just a little bit. Um, the top tier and the bottom tier and the top bunk and the bottom bunk. What's better, what's worse? You have to understand, San Quentin, it's an old school prison design, meaning that it's five tiers high. Each tier is like 12 feet or something like that. So up on the fifth tier, there's a giant concrete room. Your 60, 70 feet up in the air is the floor of your cell. And there's not great air movement in these buildings. They don't have giant fans constantly kicking the air, and uh, the architectural design is old enough they were not really thinking about it. So I would say the top two tiers, the air is very stale. And in the summer, it gets a lot hotter up there than it does for the three tiers below it. It's also a lot of stairs to climb. Uh, five stories of stairs that you got to go up and down to go to breakfast, come back, go to dinner, come back, go out to yard, go to medical, go to shower, go to whatever the heck they, you can end up climbing those stairs 15 or 20 times in a day. If you're young and in good health, great, more power to you, but a lot of dudes doing time are 40 plus, a lot of dudes doing time have lived hard lives. It's that outlaw lifestyle. You say, well, I'm not going to make it to 40, so who cares if something goes wrong? Except you do make it to 40. I mean, it blows your mind. Except now you've got a limp and your back is messed up and you broke your knuckles and maybe your teeth are a little... 
So climbing those stairs again and again, you have a lot of guys negotiating for trying to get moved down to the first or maybe even the second tier just to not have to do the stairs all day, every day. <clears throat> uh, conservative Juggalo notes that uh, San Quentin is all reception now and that there's a lot of nastiness there. I am not surprised. It's pretty well set up to be a reception center and CDC was trying to figure out what to do with it's not quite Central California, it's not quite Northern California, that Bay Area area. They diverted all of the Northern California inmates to High Desert for reception, as I understand, or at least a chunk of them. And San Quentin handles pretty much the rest. So there's got to be a huge amount of inmates transferring in and out all the time. When you have that many people meeting each other for the first time, or maybe the second time, and they know each other, yeah, there's going to be a lot of POS cuts across the face so that everybody sees him, knows he's a piece of garbage. There's going to be a lot of stabbings. People are going to be walking out of there, man, cut up. It's not all the time, but it doesn't take all the time. Whenever you're in an environment of 150 people, and just like one guy's getting stabbed every month or two, that's on your head all the time. That 150 people, somebody getting stabbed every month or so, really adds up to, well, I hope I'm not the guy that gets hit next. Gina asks if I preferred the top or the bottom bunk. I actually preferred top until uh, I said the wrong thing to the wrong dude and he ripped me off my bunk and uh, he, he messed up my back and my hip pretty bad. Sucker punched me and yanked. It was the only shot he got in was the sucker punch. But it uh, spun me enough that he was able to just grab me by my lapels and pull. And man, I hit that ground hard whenever... After that, I was a bottom bunk person, not just because I didn't want to get pulled off the rack again, but because uh, I got injured in a way that made it climbing up and down on the rack was just a little trickier. <sighs> Gina asks about how you do, uh, how you store everything in your cell, your commissary, your shoes, your personal paperwork, your photos, your legal stuff, your books, I like to read, your photo, your TV, your radio, it all adds up. And a cell is a small environment, eight feet high, six feet wide, or no, I'm sorry, 10 feet high, six feet wide, 12 feet long, eight by six by 12. It is not a big place to hang out, 10 by six by 12 anyway. It comes first with, um, you're going to have under the bed is going to be a place to store a lot of stuff. The bed is this far off of the ground, which means that if you have a bunch of canteens, soups, and cookies, and chips, and zoom zooms, and whim whams, it'll all fit under the bed pretty easily. And most bunkies just divide that area up in half or something like that. I'll keep my stuff over here, you keep your stuff over there. You also have built into the wall a locker. It's just a shelving unit. It's not really a lot and they tend to have the corners of them rounded down so that if you're in a fight and you grab somebody in the back of the back, back of the head and bring them down on that locker, well at least the corners rounded down a little bit because it's a solid piece of steel coming out of concrete. There's plenty of room to keep a television up on top of your locker, all your clothes and it depends how much you have essentially. If you're a hoarder, if you're on this episode of uh, San Quentin Hoarders, it's going to be difficult to keep all your stuff, especially if you have a lot of letters you like to keep, your books, you have extra clothes, you have three pairs of shoes because you don't want to get rid of this old one. It takes up a lot of space. But people in prison, first, are a little OCD. And you have to be. There's no choice in this. You have to be a little OCD in order to maintain. So you take your bowl and you move the three things to get your bowl, and then you put those three things back right where they go. You take your bowl and you do everything you're gonna do with it, you make your food, and as soon as you're done eating, you wash it and you dry it and you move those three things and you put it exactly back where it goes. The same for everything. This book goes on top of that book. These six things go to the right of the TV and these three things go to the left. It gets, it makes it so that you know where things are, so that things have a place, and so that they're always in the place. 
and it is a common complaint amongst sellies that it, a lot of fights have started over oh well he's a slob and slob in prison means something a little bit different than slob out in the real world the primary reason you're going to get a complaint in prison is because you can't keep your stuff squared away your bed isn't made after you wake up your clothes aren't folded properly when you put them up etc etc you have to be just a little bit ocd to get by or you're going to go a little crazy trying to find things and trying to exist in a box that I cannot stress big enough. The bathroom is probably bigger in your home than a prison cell, or at least the same size. Imagine living in that thing indefinitely, not for a day or two, but indefinitely with another person. Yeah, you start coming up with little plans. Okay, so I'll keep all my stuff in this little square box and that way, and it gets spread out, but you try let's see here uh conservative asks how i made the wall dude honest stuff th this is my home it's where i happen to have landed and that's the way the wall looks and uh, it wasn't planned at all but it sure makes a great backdrop for a prison channel because that is that is, for anyone who doesn't know didn't do time that is the back of a cell wall all i got to do is paint it gray or that is the back of a dormitory or something like that. All I got to do is uh, move a bunk in front of it. It's a uh, standard type of construction brick that they use to build this place. And it's similar to what they use in a lot, a lot of prisons. Oh, and yeah, you don't get much of a choice about whether or not you're going to be uh, a hoarder or OCD. Listen, it's something so nominal. Uh, a paper clip and I don't even mean some place where a paper clip is contraband where you can't have them just some place where you know there are paper clips around every once in a while but they're hard to come by even if they sold them on the canteen well the guys are everybody has paper clips but nobody wants to give you a paper clip you better have your own pencil pen stamp whatever it whatever the little thing is you better have your own and heck maybe your homie's gonna need one maybe you better have two in case you got to share Okay, so what do you need besides paper clips? Well, clothes, shoes, food, water, books, pictures, legal stuff, blah, 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 blah. After long enough, you have so much stuff that you need to keep where it goes in some way that you develop a little bit of OCD or you just start falling out of the sides of your locker and you're difficult to live with because you're silly. Well, he has the same problem you do. He doesn't have enough space. And whenever you start falling off the sides of your space because you can't keep things properly stored, you start impacting his quality of life. And yeah, it turns into a conversation. Mm. Oh. That is pretty much the base thing that I wanted to talk about today was the different uh, housing environments that you're likely to end up to. Dorms, gyms, cells walk alone back in the hole or the shoe i'm going to close my podcast here my broadcast here whatever you want to call it i want to thank everybody for showing up and i expect to do another live just in the next day or two i'm i'm trying to get into the stream of doing a lot more content i appreciate y'all riding with me i'm gonna close here so thank you for listening let's take some minutes